and I'm going to take us on this Palm Sunday right into our series on how to. And when you think about Palm Sunday, you know, it's a commemoration. And candidly, I don't know, sometimes I, I feel conflicted about Palm Sunday, if I'm completely honest. You know, there's a difference in a commemoration and a celebration. And it's hard in some ways for me to just, just singularly, singularly, easy for you to say, celebrate this day. There are certainly some celebratory aspects, certainly that Jesus was willing to leave heaven, come to earth, and then that this day marks the day that he was on his you know, final ascent, as it were, back to the throne. But that would take him into uh, you know, a place of mistreatment, crucifixion, and ultimately resurrection. Come on, somebody, the tomb is uh, empty. <laughs> but I'll save that for next week, right, right, right. But the part that's hard for me, I'm sure it's hard for you too, is that this is that Sunday, right? When everybody was yelling, I mean, Palm Sunday, uh, Hosanna, 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 and the same people less than a week later, crucify him, right? Crucify him. They were so fickle in the faith that they had and who he was and what he was gonna do. And I wanna come from this perspective this morning, we're pretty fickle too. Right, right, like that maybe that's a part of why this is hard is because if we're honest, we would have to admit that often we ourselves are somewhat fickle, not only in our faith, but I would say in the way that we rep the heart of God and the way that we live into who he's called us to be as, as we represent him in, in our relationships, we're really fickle. I mean, fickle in regards to faith, fickle in regards to commitment in relationship, and again, in our commitment to just act and interact in a godly way today. Today's how-to message is how to live godly relationships. And if you're new to us, ever so often I like to give us a little takeaway, which is just a synoptic of what I've said so far. And often the first takeaway is a bit of a thesis statement. And this morning I'll begin with this. Broken relationships mark the lives of the lost and unfortunately sometimes the found. And I don't believe that that's the will of God. I don't believe we're meant to live in broken relationships. And I understand that, that uh, relationships involve more than one person. So I get that there are choices made in relationships that are not our choice. Maybe something has happened to you that wasn't done by you. And I am sorry for that and I understand that. But I'm really talking about the part of this that each of us can be personally responsible for. You know, like I'm talking about not just having godly relationships. All right, are y'all with me? but being godly in relationship. That's really what I'm talking about today. How can I, how can you be godly in our relationships? Because we're called to that. When you think about the word relationships or the word relate, it just means how something or uh, someone interacts or connects. You think about um, chemicals in a compound. They, the different chemicals will change the compound. They'll react or interact or connect in a different way. Cars on the road, everybody, you know, uh, they interact. Help, help us, Lord, we hope in a way that's not destructive. Um, think about right now is March Madness, lots of basketball, players on a team or people in a family. Hmm how we're going to interact and connect, okay? And family's not just biological, okay? We got us a church family up in here. You know, and that's not always been a pretty picture, right? Maybe for some. Uh, that's been a tough bit of the journey, too. The truth is our connections and interactions with others should represent the way God relates to us. All of them. So this morning you may have thought, well, I'm up in here and I don't even, you know, I don't have a significant other. This isn't about a specific relationship. Again, that's not what I'm trying to accomplish this morning. I think there's much to teach about uh, relationships between a man and a woman or, or between friends or maybe a, um, a mom with a daughter, dad, mom and dad with kids or man, come on, I feel a little bit concerned for my kids. Uh, someone asked me earlier, you know, how old is your oldest? And I said, 34. And just saying it out loud kind of freaked me out a little bit, you know. So we have 34 and 33, and we're also blessed to be raising an eight-year-old. But I was thinking, man, I hope I age well, you know, because I know sometimes, man, the relationships we have with our aging parents, come on, all the old people's in the house, you know, cut them folks some slack. The relationships that we have and being able to be godly in them, all of us from both directions, in the workplace, Hmm, standing in the checkout line at the food line, everybody. Godly, 
Whew, customer service calls. All right, okay, I'm just saying, we're called to be godly, always godly in the way we relate. You can advocate for what's right in a godly and righteous way. Did you know that? Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna preach it either way. I mean, it's fine. How to um, live godly relationships. Peter gave us some instructions, 2 Peter 1, 5. He said, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence. All these are relationally related. And moral excellence with knowledge. And knowledge with, oop, self-control. Self-control with patient endurance. Man, these are all about relationship. And patient endurance with godliness, acting like God in the context of the relationships. And godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. So not only our brothers, that's what that's about. So this doesn't just extend to the people we actually like, brotherly affection, but also love for, everybody say it with me, everyone. Love for everyone. Time for the people of faith to represent the heart of the Father. And then he said, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the previous passages, Peter had said that we actually find everything we need for living a godly life in relationship with Jesus. That's where, that's where this comes from. But he said, then you still have a part to play. You still have a choice to make to be godly in, in this world and in your relationships uh, Paul talking to his young steward Timothy, though, literally said, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. It's a challenge, okay? I get it. I'm not trying to make this sound uh, easy, but that's what grace is for, everybody. Some of y'all like, man, you don't know when they poke me. You don't know when they poke me. You don't know where they poke me. You don't know how they poke me. I didn't say it was always easy, but there's grace for it. Can I get a witness on that? God wouldn't call us to something he can't accomplish in us and through us. We got to step up to that. There's grace for it. And we're called to it. We're called to be godly. But Paul challenged the Corinthians. He wrote them two letters, and they were both pretty long. And in the first letter, and up early in the letter, he said, 1 Corinthians 3, 3, you are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Rather than redeem sons and daughters. Now, if you're in the house this morning and you haven't yet decided to follow Jesus, I'm going to work on that today too. I'm going to encourage you toward him. But I'm preaching this word to folks in the house of faith, and you can come along as well because you'll get something from it, I promise. But listen, everybody, I'm talking about redeemed sons and daughters ought to live with the heart of the Father. You understand? And, and be godly in the way that we relate. But how? How do we do that in this broken world? How are we going to pull that off? Well, I'm going to just share three quick and simple ones this morning, and they're probably not going to be quite what you would expect because they're not just these simple uh, ins behavioral instructions. And I, I think they'll, some of those will probably filter their way into this word. And there was one conversation about doing a whole series on relationships. But again, in this context, I'm talking about being godly in relationship. And the first how to for us in that regard is choose the right order. Man, if we're going to be godly in relationship with others, we have to choose the right order. Last week, we finished up a word uh, on how to live in freedom with a point that was simplistically live for God and others. And I came from this passage in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. I could have read from Deuteronomy and gotten the same word, but the, the word of the Lord to us and at that time to the questioners was this, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. You got to choose the right order in relationship. If you get your relationships out of order, they won't work. What do I mean by that? I mean, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. That's what I mean. Y'all ain't been in grade school math in a minute, I see. 
Pedmas, as it were, because you think about the fact that I mentioned a minute ago, man, order uh, those cars on the road, there has to be some design. If we don't walk in the design, then we experience destruction. They, one set drives on that side and the other set drives on that side. You understand what I'm saying? Like there's an order uh, and a design in the universe and without it, there's destruction. And we are designed first for relationship with God. And if we don't have a relationship with God, we're destructive in the relationships we have with others. It's true. You got God first. God's the only one that can make us good together. Start with God. You say, well, somebody say, well, what's the most important thing to you? Don't say church. I'm not saying you should say that. I'm saying say God. The church fits in the framework of our spiritual priorities for sure. But I'm not telling you to sacrifice your family. I'm saying the only way to, to have tight and right relationships with your family is to put God first. That's what I'm saying. Get the order right. You think about that math uh, acronym I shared a second ago, man. You know, math, it is what it is. It works the way it works, and you're not going to change it just because you don't like it. All right? Two plus three times four minus five. They like to throw this stuff on social media and try to trip people up. Well, that's the answer. Well, you can't just work it from left to right, right? Pedma, everybody. <laughs> In that equation, you got to do the multiplication first. Three times four is 12. Now, you can add or subtract however you want to. That doesn't really matter. But 3 times 4 is 12, right? Plus 2 is 14. Minus 5 is 9. That's the answer. You are so impressed. <laughs> right? Well, listen. But if you do it right, if you do it the way you think you want to do it, well, I'll just do it my way. 3 plus 2 or 2 plus 3 is 5 times 4 is 20. Minus 5 is 15. Well, it's the wrong answer. See, the problem... <laughs> Order matters. And you can decide to go try to live these relationships without God, and, and I won't even say good luck, because I think that's sacrilegious to say. It's not possible for the equation of relationship to work in our lives. Man, the first command, the first, I mean, when he, when he made a list, when he made the top 10, the first one in Exodus that he, he listed or that he mentioned, Exodus 23, you shall have no other God beside me nothing and no one can be God for you just God and if you want to really love the people in your life love God first all right and then a second is equally important love your neighbor as yourself or others you could just parenthetically put others in that passage right now he didn't say love your neighbor more than yourself he said, love your neighbor as yourself. There's an, uh, an assumption here that you're going to love yourself. And if there's a place where we need to work on letting God reveal to us who we are and how valuable we are to him and others, then that's, that's a message for sure as well. But the reality is we are generally pretty good at caring about us, but not so great at caring about others. And, and Jesus was intentional about putting, out, uh, putting uh, this perspective in the passage Love your neighbor as yourself. The truth is, first, we are incapable of being godly in our relationships unless God is first in our lives. So that's first. But then secondly, we have this propensity or tendency to want to look out for number one. Even if and when we might put God first. And it's like, well, i got to look out for me and mine. i got to look out for number one. And that's, well, you do got to look out for number one. That's true. That's a true statement. That is on point, actually. It's just that he's number one. So if we get that right, right, and then when we get that right, God's going to give us a heart for others. The key here is not to think less of yourself. It's to think about yourself less. Get yourself out of the middle before the wheels come off. Understand what I'm saying? I'll, I'll move on. Matter of fact, it was Paul who wrote to the Philippians and said, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Those are broken relational patterns, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. And then look at the wording here. Let each of you look not only to his own interest. He didn't say, don't take care of yourself, but also to the interest of others. And for me, the way I think about this, he said, well, what does that look like? What's others and 
You know, I'm not, I'm not a, a person or a pastor who believes that you should sacrifice your friends and family for the ministry or anything like that. I think the best ministry starts in my house, right? It starts with family and those closest to me. I got fam friends that are like family and it starts, it just doesn't stop there. That's what others looks like. I mean, to, for me, it goes to the uttermost parts of the earth. Why? Because that's the, way, that's the way God laid it out for us. Choose the right order. Secondly, choose the right time. Timing is pretty important in every aspect of life and living. Timing is important. But I'm not specifically, especially talking about timing. I, I will say to you, though, that it matters. Like there's some things you need to remember in relationship about time and timing, when to talk about things. Karen and I have fun conversations with people about that, some of the lessons we've learned. And there are certain things that you need to remember. Like I need to remember that Tuesday is our 36th wedding anniversary. Ah, uh, what, what? You know what I'm saying? And, and there are timings like birthdays and anniversaries and times for conversations. You know, we try to coach people in relationship when to talk about things, how to talk about things. Come on, those timings and those perspectives matter. When to introduce a conversation. If, you're, if we are talking about, I don't care if we're just talking about a couple of friends. You don't call me at 10 o'clock at night and lay something heavy on me. I was just watching Sports Center. I ain't ready for that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Come on now, there's a the right timing, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm actually referring to in this context, choose the right time, is more so don't let the past wreck your present. I'm talking about the right time for godly in relationship and being godly in relationships is right now. And if you live in the past or only in the future, you're going to wreck the present. The time to be godly is, is now in relationship live in the present and for the future, not the past. How to have godly relationships, how to live godly in relationships right now. The grace that you have in this moment is sufficient for every interaction and connection you have. Isaiah 43, 18, Isaiah had a word from the Lord to the people of God and candidly he was coming after he had had a word from God that reminded them of the faithfulness of God. This wasn't even a remembrance of something bad. They were presently in a tough situation. But here's still what the word of the Lord was for them. He said, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Come on, somebody ought to get happy right there. Because regardless of your hurt or history or your past or what you've gone through in this life so far, you get to choose godly in relationship and believe for everything that God wants and wills for you right now, today and going forward. But if you live in the past, you're going to put so much pressure on present relationships, you're going to break them. It doesn't matter if that past was good or bad. You're going to break them. Choose the right time, and this is the time to lean into God for grace. Man, and we come from it. I mean, maybe you have a broken family history. Maybe you have had difficulty historically in work situations, and it just feels like it's always going to be that workplace that everybody's mean, and you got this attitude of consternation because that's what you've experienced so far. I don't know. Work, church, come on. There's some church hurt out here. I get it. Here at A2A, we don't talk bad about the church. That's the bride of Christ. Don't talk bad about a man's wife, especially not Jesus. But I'm not ignorant. We've been both the biter and the bitten. We've experienced the problems and we've caused the problems, okay? But if we live in our hurt, church history, we're never going to get to live into all the amazing, beautiful relationships we can have, we can have now. <clears throat> Don't overcompensate for something missing in your history of relationship and mess up what God is doing now. I'm going to let that sit there for a second. We tend to overcompensate. We ain't going to trust nobody or we're going to be harder on someone in this area because someone failed us there in the past. And we overcompensating. God don't need our help in that. He needs us to apply his word and his will and be godly in the way we relate. And let that past be the past. And if we do that, come on, we can be godly and have godly. 
Are we together on it? <laughs> Give me a good amen right there then. Yeah. Wouldn't hurt nobody. Wouldn't hurt a soul. I mean, and, it, and no matter what that history is, man, you can go all Romans 8, 28 on it. We know that in all things, God's at work for the good. That's what he does. He redeems it even when it wasn't good. That's how he rolls, right, 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 right. And then maybe is, there's some people, like, it, it wasn't even that good. You know, when people refer to the good old days, they really weren't that good. I mean, there was always something you could find that wasn't good, but you do like picking the one thing from your history that was good, and it don't matter how good the next relationship or situation is, if it isn't as good in that one area, you unfair about it. Let's go lean into gratitude for what we've got. Come on, somebody. The like Ecclesiastes 7.10, Solomon, who had to follow his dad, David, said, don't be asking where are the good old days. Wise folks don't ask questions like that. <laughs> That's so good. Just stop it. Here we are, okay? And we're living in that direction, and we have an opportunity to choose godly. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. The reality is we need to learn from our past, but don't live in the past. I'm going to say it again. Learn from the past, but don't live in the past. And don't ask anybody else to live there either. We're trying to make a lot of folk live in the past. I wasn't there. Or if I was, I'm not there anymore. In some cases, I was there. <laughs> okay, I'll admit it, you know. But thank God for the grace to go that way. One thing I do, Paul said, forgetting what is, lies behind and straining toward what lies ahead. And understand, Paul had a lot of past to regret. Paul, first Saul, was a persecutor of the church. He had so, he could have, every bit of his future could have been hijacked by his past if he had let it. But he leaned into godly and relationship like maybe no one else in the history of history. He chose it. He chose redemption and he chose restoration and he lived in it. How did he do it? By moving on toward the goal for the prize of the up upward call of Christ Jesus. The truth is we get to live. When we live for Jesus, when we rep his heart in our relationships, there's incredible redemption. This morning's poem is simply called Redemption. When I live my life for Jesus to rep his kingdom here on earth, it's in my everyday relationships, my living finds eternal worth. Godliness without loving is a lifeless masquerade, but when I'm godly in relating, His grace and mercy are displayed. When I live with love for others and what I say and what I do, the hope of wholeness found in Jesus is the message that comes through. The world is tired from being broken, separated and torn apart. Yet when we love like God intended, in us they'll see the Father's heart. Start with those who are the closest. Don't stop there. There's more to do. And what you give in love to others, God will give right back to you. Come on. How to live godly relationships? Get the order right. Get the timing right. Right? Choose the right timing and ultimately choose the right contents. I mean, at the end of it, um, godly in relationships is a matter of the heart, right? Come on, y'all know the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Godly relating, that's where it comes from. James asked the question in James 4 1. There was lots of fights in the first rendition of the New Testament church. And James, the brother of Jesus, asked, he said, Where do these wars and fights come from among you? Don't they come from the war that's going on inside of you or in your own heart? Like the war starts here. And I joke perpetually around here. You know, like if you are uh, at war in your own heart, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what somebody else does. It doesn't matter how kind, how uh, correct they are and the way they act or interact with you. And no one's perfect, but you're going to be mad because you're mad. It don't matter. But the, the honest... Uh, Opposite of that, which is also awesome but somewhat troubling, is that when you're in a good space, you can't even get mad at people. Sometimes I want to be mad at folks. I'm like, man, I want to be mad at you, but I just can't. I wish that was more often even, right? Because if you're at peace with God in your heart, you, can't, you might get a, mad, a little mad, but you can't stay mad. Where does it come from? It's all about what's, in, it's all about what's inside the 
heart, man. I mean, if you want to know what's in someone, like someone rolling down the hallway, the folks around here who can be a little snarky, but they mean it in the kindest, sweetest sort of way, will say, we know where Ron been because there's coffee spilled on the floor. You know, I like my coffee full. <laughs> and if you want to know what's in someone's cup, bump into them. Mm. Mm. Come on, when someone bumps into you, what do they find out about what's in your heart? How to live godly relationships? Choose the right contents. Yeah, you get to decide what is in here. Jesus said in Luke 6, 45, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury. What's in there of an evil heart? What you say flows from what, right, is in your heart. I mean, if you like the old rendition of that verse, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we find out, we find out what's in our hearts. What about things like, so you're in that space and it's not even right when, when there's a moment of consternation or conflict. I'm talking about preloading. What am I gonna think about? Am I gonna think about what, what's not good? Man, and around here, even at 828 and in the way that we live and operate as a team, we, we are not afraid of, of thinking through what we need to do with the Lord to uh, execute his ideas more impactfully. I'm not afraid of that. We do that all the time. I'll say, well, I think we, we probably missed it on that. We could have done that differently or better, but that's not the same as being critical. You understand what I'm saying? Like just landing in a space, honest evaluation is good for the heart. I'm not referring to that. But there is a place or a space where when we're thinking about our relationships, if we could be grateful, that would go a long way. We're preloading some really good stuff when we say, well, maybe that's not exactly the way I want, but man, I love this and I'm thankful for that. And grace, you know, just like preload grace in your heart. I'm gonna be gracious in my relationships and in my interactions and my connections. I have already decided that for the, before the Lord. Where did I get it? I got it from God. Who gave it to me? He did. I'm only giving what I've been given and you can't outgive God. Sow that seed and reap that fruit in a relationship. You want to have godly relationships? You want to be godly in a relationship? Quit always criticizing everyone who's in relationship with you, but believe in the good that's there and be happy about it. You know, and probably we're a part of it anyway. What is good and what isn't, we're probably a part of it. Just head that way. All right, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mention again, Karen and I have been married 36 years this Tuesday. There are times when I'm thinking, uh, whew, she seems a little, well, how could she not be? Uh, she seems a little crazy, but how could she not be? She's been married to me for 36 years. <laughs> She's doing great. That's what I think. I think, man, this woman has an incredible amount of sanity for someone who's been married to me for 36 years. I ain't making that up. She's sitting right there. I'm a little afraid right now. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. But it's true. That's how I see her. I see her as an incredible gift from God. On the days when she seems to like me and the days it's not quite as obvious. I always know she does. You get what you give. Reap what you sow. What's in there? What's in there? And that means that sometimes somebody's going to honk at you and cuss out in traffic, and that's not what you're giving back because that's not who you are. Does that impact your closer relationship? Sure it does. You think you can cuss out and fuss out at work and eventually it won't find it, its way to your closer friendships or to your house? You're wrong. You're wrong. Every seed that takes root is going to bear fruit. And these relational interactions everywhere are, are meant to be godly. What is in your heart? And, and I'll just say this too. If you're always trying to fix a relationship, it will probably stay broken. And we give that counsel consistently. Because that means that we're, instead of working on our own personal competency to be better in relationship, we're working on being critical. And when we live like that, we break, we break it before God can heal it. Or as fast as he does. 
If you're always trying to fix it now, should, should we always be working on it? Absolutely. With the Holy Spirit, we can always be working on it, but don't be trying to fix it. Fixing it says, this is so messed up and blah, 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 blah. And then it has no opportunity to be healthy or whole. Work on it with gladness and gratitude and grace and watch God do big work and healing. Last week's word on the heart was about guarding your heart. And I said, guard your heart aggressively, aggressively, not passively, but aggressively guard your heart. But, and that was really a lot about like making decisions in regards to what we let in, right? But let me talk in this moment about being healthy in your heart also has a lot to do with not what you keep out, but what you put in. The thoughts you choose to think, the way you approach uh, life and all of those thought choices matter a lot, man. And I'm going to work hard to make my heart healthy, not just by keeping bad things out. but by letting God put good things in. Carissa's gonna join me on the stage. I want us to have plenty of time to respond this morning. The best way ultimately to take care of your heart is to hand your heart to him. Because what separates us from each other and from God is sin. And it's not just sin, but it's our sin nature. Like our, okay, so this is after the fall, right? This became the nature of humanity. And Paul wrote about this to the Galatians. He said, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, he didn't just say when you sin, it's following that sinful nature, but acts follow nature. The results then, he said, are very clear. And see how all of these relate to relationship. He said, the results are clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures. All those things come from broken relationship. This is when we're not godly in relationship. Then we try to, we try to fill a void that was meant to be filled by God idolatry, sorcery, and there's a lot in that. I don't have time to preach in this moment, but those two matter too. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy. Where does it come from? Outbursts of anger following our sinful nature. And this is what results. These are the choices then that we make. It's not what God wants. Come on, redeemed sons and daughters. It's not what the Father wants from us. It's not what the Father's gifted and given to us. It's not how we're called or made to live. We're not created for that. We're called and created for godly. How you doing, everybody? <laughs> listen, listen, hear me. Conviction, not condemnation. We all got work to do. Lord knows I do. And that's a statement of fact. Conviction, not condemnation. This is an opportunity for us to grow. Outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division. Man, the enemy's been punking us so hard. Culturally, it's pushed us apart. Don't you love that God's bringing us together? Let's work on that. Let's work on that together. Be godly in our relationships. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties. And then he gave us a synoptic because the list could go on forever and sins like these. Then he said, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not kingdom living. But thank God for a conjunction. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of, the Holy Spirit produces a different kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, which never hurt anybody. That's a good thing to develop. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. And we'll pick this up next week because we, we nailed that stuff to the cross with Jesus. Come on. This is not how we live anymore. We're not driven by that sin nature, those passions of the flesh. Listen, if you write that post and it don't belong on your wall, delete it. Read that text before you send it and check it out with the Holy Spirit. Hold those words for a second longer and see what the Father's heart says. That stuff died. Build, don't break. Build, don't break. Sometimes building is hard work and painful too, but it's different than breaking. Come on, worship team.
Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading. Bill, don't break in every part of our lives. And then just this, and I'll land. You know, the reality is there are, there are lots of desires in this house for things that the Lord has dreamed for you and wills for you. And, you. and you can live in broken relationship and only push them farther away. But the Word of God in Psalm 84 says, the Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. Now we need to do the right thing because the right thing is the right thing to do. But understand me when I say this, if you will live godly in your relationships, God will take care of you. He'll take care. The fruit of the Spirit is the only recipe destined to produce graced, godly relationships. Lord, right now I pray that you would um, help us understand in this moment how to respond to your word this morning. Help us to know what it is that you will to do in us in this moment, Jesus. How we can give our relational responses and reactions to you so that we can learn to relate in a godly way. How we can bring our past that has perpetually um, created an obstacle as we press into our future and present relationships. Lord, how we can lay that down and let you heal it, take it away, that we can learn but not live. Help us to understand that. Call that to our hearts in this moment, Jesus, so we can gift it, give it to you and move forward godly in relationships. So here's what we're gonna do. They're gonna take us back into this worship song in a second, but I want us to respond first. So would you stand with me? So I'm gonna ask you, <clears throat> just right off the back of the message, if in this moment you know that there's a place in your life where you've got some past hurt or history that's, hampering your ability to be godly in relationship going forward. I want you to come stand right here. I'm gonna pray. Just move, 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 move. Thanks for being brave and honest. If you're in this space and you say, it isn't even so much my past. I just, man, I struggle with what's in my cup. Oof. You know, cause people, people, maybe that's it. You just wanna be honest. Say, I, wanna, I want you to pray for me this morning. I'm gonna pray some things break off, some things change. Yeah, I want, I want to make right choices in relationship. Maybe that's you. If that's you in this house this morning, you just say, you know what? I just want to make right choices in relationship. I have several that are complicated and I know I need God's help. They're complicated and I know I need God's help. If that's you, move. Come on. Come on, I don't think you are done if that's you. I got complicated relationships in my life every day and I want to be godly in them. I want to be godly in them. I'm here for all of these. I, I need to jump down there and just be here for all of those. Now, come press in real quick, church family. Come press in. I just need some people behind some people. Maybe you came for prayer, but you can also pray for somebody. Just put a hand on the back of somebody. Everybody's qualified to pray. You're all right. That's all right. I need some help right here in the middle. Come on, J. Lou. There you go. You got that. That's fine. Just put a hand on somebody's back. All right. Y'all ready to believe for something? Who's ready for some relational breakthrough this morning? Y'all just start praying, I'm gonna pray too. Lord, we wanna put you at the center of it all. We want you to be the center of our lives, God. We want, we wanna be in orbit around the sun, hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd help us in the way that we act and interact and connect, God, to be godly. Teach us godly relationship, Lord. Help us, help us, God, e even to choose now as the opportunity to live in a different way than maybe uh, we've lived before or maybe to move past how we've been treated, to not let someone else determine the level of our godliness in interacting and relating, Lord Jesus. I pray no hurt or history will keep us from the beautiful plans and purposes you have for us in relationship, Jesus. Teach us to learn from and not live in the past, but to travel forward, believing that God's best plans and dreams, I just pray that, that God's best plans and dreams, every purpose, every, every will, every way, Lord, that you want to make, God, that that's, that lives out in our lives and in front of us, Jesus, that we can be whole and healthy sons and daughters who relate in this world in such a way that there's no denying the living Christ, that you are alive and you are well. You didn't stay on the cross, but you've been resurrected in us. Help us, God, to live into every relationship in a godly way according to your will, according to your word. Give us patience, give us peace, come on. Give us grace. 
Boatloads of grace. Give me grace. Come on, you pray that prayer for you. Give me the grace, God, to handle my heart according to your will so that no matter how I'm bumped, what comes out is God and good.